Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. In this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome back to the Power Hungry Podcast, my friend, Jesse Ossibel. Jesse, welcome back to the Power Hungry Podcast. Robert, good to be back. So, uh, Jesse, you know, you've been on the podcast. I've warned you, you're going to introduce yourself. You have about 60 seconds. Please introduce yourself. I work in environmental science and technology. Uh, the first decade or so of my career, I worked mainly for the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Engineering in Washington, D.C., uh, with occasional forays to uh, Vienna. I had some Cold War adventures at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in, in, uh, in Austria, a U.S.-Soviet think tank. And for more than 30 years, I worked at the Rockefeller University here in New York City. I'm director of the Program for the Human Environment. Uh, I both do research. I'm still a working stiff. Uh, I'm still publishing papers, have papers in review. Uh, and I also manage research projects. And I've managed some big, complex, global environmental projects, uh, trying to count all the fish in, in the sea, for example. Uh, my interests are environmental, on the one hand, ecological, trees, fish, uh, climate, human population. But also, I'm very interested in the history and evolution of technology that bears on the environment. Uh, technologies for farming, for mobility, uh, for for energy. And I'm a little unusual in that people tend to be either on the sort of green ecological side or more on the engineering side. And uh, I've kind of pursued both together. That's a fair estimate. So Census of Marine Life, the new eDNA project, there are many, I won't list them all. But uh, let's uh, just recent history, you won the Nirenberg Prize. Um uh, previous recipients have included David, David Attenborough and Jane Goodall. That's pretty flattering. I mean, how does that feel? Well, it's the biggest uh, recognition I've re received in my career, so it, it feels great. Uh, we just had a uh, an event out in La Jolla at the University of California at San Diego and Scripps Institution of Oceanography in October, and I talked about some of what we'll talk about in the in the next hour. Uh, and I would say the the recognition came for, uh, on the one hand, how you know some in inventive uh, ideas, but also trying to do science for the benefit of society, uh, trying to do things that not only I'll say uh, alerting people to dangers, but also trying to point out uh, some solutions and ways to make things better. Good. Well, let's talk about that because uh, we spoke briefly about uh, how how you the things you wanted to talk about uh, before we started recording, um, and you gave a lecture um, in uh, in accepting the the Nirenberg Prize. The title is "Peak Human?" Question mark Thoughts on the evolution of the enhancement of human performance. What is peak human? People certainly are familiar with the idea of peak oil. That uh, sometime around now or in 10 years or in 30 years, or at one time people believe 30 years ago, uh, consumption of uh, petroleum would peak. Uh, we ourselves have worked on that. I've also worked on the question of peak farmland, is the amount of arable land uh, used uh, in the world at a peak. And uh, so I pose the question of peak human with several dimensions. On the one hand, are we as machines, if you look at us a little bit like light bulbs or automobiles, are we uh, at or near a peak? And collectively, uh, peak, uh, pop human population, a lot of people think that human population may peak later in the century. So could we be at peak humans? And then of course, as an American, I'm interested in, in the US and in particular, what's happening to the 330, 340 million Americans? Are we in some way peaking? So in the lecture, I tried to use some of the interest in long time series that we've developed for looking at things like the evolution of agriculture or the evolution of, of uh, transport uh, to look at, at uh, humanity in the way that we might look at, uh, at, uh, at cars or computers. Well, and I, you were graciously shared your slides with me then in, from your lecture and a lot of these things that you're tracking and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a sports fan, although I've quit you watching television, but I'm still a sports fan and you fit a lot of these, these trends onto S curves. So I want to come back to S curves, but you, you specifically focus in the, in your lecture on four dimensions of human performance, the physical, that is how far, how fast can people go? 
lifetime, how long do we live, et cetera, cognitive and immune systems. Can you walk us through those? Because they're, I mean, this is, a, these are big ideas you're, you're talking about. And I know we only have an hour here, but you know, walk us through those different, if, is that the, the structure that would work the best to talk about those four or is there a yes. better way to approach this? No, that's great. And I'd be, I'm very grateful for the opportunity because these are a new set of ideas. Uh, I hope some of them will soon be published, but I don't think anybody else has ever uh, really written or thought about this very much. So I, it's uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to talk about it, get feedback and, and see how people react also. Sure. Yeah. Well, if you think about, uh, uh, you mentioned you're a sports fan and uh, obviously people are very familiar with the idea of peak performance from athletics. Uh, the Olympics, so to say, or 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 marathons. So that's our framework. That's the first part of our framework. And then another question is, as you say, how long do people live? Uh, sort of things that are uh, your eyesight, your uh, uh, hearing, things that are associated with your your lifetime. Uh, and then a third area uh, is uh, IQ and things like that. You know, how how smart are we? How literate? And then the fourth area that. Uh, we look at very important, obviously brought to the foreground by COVID, is uh, how resistant are we to 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 illness, disease, problems. Uh, so that's our framework. These four areas, and then we, we, you know, we but we're willing to look at all the different ways people may uh, enhance their performance. So these could be who your parents are, or whom you whom you marry, uh, how much sleep and rest you get. Uh, training and education, uh, uh, use of drugs, uh, use of better sneakers, uh, all kinds of things. So we we are completely open to a very broad spectrum of uh, of the ways that each of these things, uh, each of the the, the let's say eight or nine or ten different ways that uh, performance can be enhanced. Well, and so, and that includes, well, since we, you know, we, we, you mentioned sports, um, I'm thinking about Lance Armstrong and there's a, a very interesting part where he, in the, in the, in the lecture, you talk about human potential is much higher than human performance. And you, you have a slide in your slide deck where you talked about the energy density of humans, which you and you uh, helped me understand uh, very early on power, the importance of power density, energy density. And you say it's three Watts per kilogram. That's for humans. I, uh, in my last book, in my fifth book, uh, Smaller, Faster, Lighter, Denser, Cheaper, I talk about Michele Ferrari, who was uh, the one who helped Lance Armstrong cheat. And and Ferrari said that for cyclists, elite cyclists, they have to have an energy density twice that, 6.7 watts per kilogram. So anyway, it's fascinating to think about human output in watts. But can you walk us through that physical part then, the, you know, yeah. the, the, and how that, especially like the 100 meter sprint, which is when the Olympics is one of the most famous competitions in 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 our culture would can you talk about that specifically or yes, what, what yeah, part of that me, do you want I'll, to talk about I'll, let me just preface that briefly by saying what you point out is very important first we're, we within a human population of course there are going to be some people let's say who are six watts and some people who are three watts so 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 there's a spectrum within and you can go up by training and so forth so there's the question of how we compare to one another and what the averages are and what the there's the the average and this the peak in the sense of where the average you know are people on average living 70 years or 40 years and then there's the question of you know the methuselah and the same is true in all these areas I'll speak about. And then there's the question of how we compare to machines, of course, because uh, for a long time uh, there was no alternative. But you know, then uh, horsepower came along. I mean, we we harnessed you know oxen and horses. But in the last two hundred years, of course, on the physical side, uh, you know, we, we not only ran faster, but we invented cars and airplanes. Okay, but let me go now to the to the uh, to the uh, the, the the Olympic type events uh, the, like the sprinting that you talked about, um, and uh, of course you know the Olympics go back to Olympia in ancient Greece uh, two thousand five hundred years ago, but they got really organized uh, around nineteen hundred or so, and so we have lots and lots of records of human performance since about nineteen hundred for things like running, jumping, swimming. And what we see is that in these areas, there's been uh, just an incredible enhancement of performance. So uh, you could think of it this way, that basically if the Olympics are going to happen in four years, you could always expect that a lot of new records would be set. And those might be set for because people had better training or because uh, they had better, and better coaching or because they had better sneakers uh, or because we were drawing the athletes from a bigger pool, you know, for example, Jesse Owens, African-Americans, or 
you know, in, in, in marathon running, the Ethiopians and the Moroccans who uh, are, uh, uh, have good lungs from working and living at high altitude. So there are a lot of different ways. But if you look, if it doesn't matter which activity you look at, there's been this incredible in, in improvement uh, relative to 100 or even 200 years ago. If you go back in something like bicycling, you mentioned Lance Armstrong, an Austin, Austin boy, uh, there was a sort of 100-year S-curve of improvement in bicycle riding, bicycle racing, culminating with a Belgian named Eddie Merckx uh, in the 1970s. And so you can think of all the bicyclists in the world, in a sense, as a single cognitive formation. You know, it's like the it's like the peloton of cyclists uh, in right. the race. Sure. All of these people are, you know, they're learning, you know, is it a better bicycle? Is it the way I bend on the bicycle? You know, is it the exercises? You know, is it the is it the the, the drugs I take? Whatever. So this cluster of of, let's say, a few hundred top cyclists around the world were pushing all the frontiers collectively and behaving as in a sense as one organism like one sunflower in a sense and going up this s curve uh, and really improving the performance and then there was a second so there was one big pulse of, on the bicycle racing and then there was a smaller one that began around 1980 and this is sort of another pattern that we see whether it's sprinting uh, again, there's a big improvement, but then in the last 20 years or so, it's gotten harder to win gains at these physical kinds of things. Because we're reaching the limit of the absolute limit, whether it's EPO or steroids or whatever, le reaching the, I mean, this is, you've, uh, I remember very clearly that Jonathan Vodders, I believe is his last name. He, he's now a, a cycling coach of memory serves and he competed in the tour and he made it, he wrote about cheating. And in fact, he said the difference between winning the tour de France and last place is about 1%. I mean, it's just a very, very small margin. And so any bit of advantage that they can get from use from doping, then takes them from the end of the pack to the front of the pack. And so, but, but is your overall point here that we're reaching that, that, that those gains you, you, you pointed out are, are plateauing and that these incremental changes or incremental improvements are, are, are becoming harder and harder to achieve for I anyone, whether they're elite or not. Yes. Uh, well, not necessarily for the non-elite, but the elite. Yeah. We, we, and, and it's in a sense, if you were got into swimming or cycling or uh, any of these activities in 1850 or 1900 or even 1950, there was an enormous amount of possibility. And now we've exploited a lot of those possibilities. And so it's harder and harder to find things that still work. Now, in a sense, we would regard cheating as part of the game. That's okay. I mean, in the sense that people are always cheating. So it's, right. you know, crime is part of the system, so to say. So, uh, but it's gotten in all these things. It's gotten harder and harder. So yeah. So this and this question of peak, you know, we we have to ask. Let's say in the in the next Olympics or the Olympics in 2040 or 2060, are as many records going to be set as were set recently? And my own view and the view of some colleague, terrific colleagues in France, a group led by uh, uh, Jeffrey Bertolo and others. Uh, we think that uh, you know it's getting that's it's getting harder and harder. There will be more gains, but it's getting harder and harder. And some of it is really pretty exotic stuff, you know, like the 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 sort of spandex nylon swimsuits that uh, the swimmers were using for a while, and then were then people decided that was cheating and you couldn't use them. Uh, but but uh, it, so so I would say at that very top, it's getting harder and harder to go up. But imitating the people near the top and getting better is still pretty easy. If you think of even something like three-point baskets in the NBA, you know, it was looked like a miracle at the start when Steve Kerr or somebody shot those uh, or Steph Curry. But now there are dozens, it turns out there are dozens of pros who've learned to do that. And the same is true in marathon running. You know, it was amazing for people to do, for men, let's say, to do two hours and 20 minutes or women to do two and a half hours. And now scores of people can do that. So, so the fast follower phenomenon is really important. This is a general comment, Robert, about technology, I'd say, and learning around the world. You know, the you take a lot of bruises and you try a lot of things to be at the very forefront. Once you've learned something, whether it's how to make a nuclear weapon or how to build an automobile, a lot of other people can copy. And so part of what we see in the performance enhancement, part of the big opportunity is, let's say, for you and me to become better swimmers. We're not going to become the top swimmers. 
but but you and I or your children can can imitate and learn to shoot a three point basket or do a lot of things that 50 years ago would have been record breaking. Right. Because we have better sneakers. We have better training regimens. The, the regimens are the, 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 the training systems, the weightlifting, all of these are much more refined than they were when I was a kid. Well, so then let's talk about if, if, it, if, if we've covered that enough, what about lifetime? You also, one of the things we talked about was peak baby and, and there, there's a difference between what you said, I think peak human and peak humans. Right. So we're facing a demographic shift as well. And this is something Peter Zion talked in a recent, you know, that a lot of countries are facing this demographic uh, uh, plateau. Talk about the, the, the lifetime issues about how long we live yeah. and how well we live. Well, the same way that, again, if you look at if the expectation of our, uh, uh, let's say, our parents and our grandparents uh, were that uh, you could, let's say, run faster and jump higher. Uh, the expectation for uh, in the in the uh, in at least in the prosperous countries since about since the Industrial Revolution, let's say since 1750, 1800 in countries like the UK or Netherlands, Sweden, US, is that you would live longer than your parents and that there would be more of you uh, uh, and, and that your and that your children would be taller than you are. Uh, so the. Uh, uh, so th through better diet, nutrition, uh, the uh, uh, better ways to deal with the winter and the cold or the heat, uh, our population has grown. Uh, we've adapted to uh, uh, to all kinds of things. So people live all over the world. They, they, you know, the the in North America, the GDP in Calgary or Edmonton is about the same as in Phoenix or or Miami. So people have learned to thrive. To, to have good performance in all kinds of places where it used to be that people said, well, people had short lives in the tropics, let's say. Right. Uh, but we've learned. So, so life expectancy in, in, uh, uh, um, in almost all countries went from, let's say the 35 or 40 years that was typical of the, of the, what we would anthropologists called hunter gatherer societies up to 50 or 60. And then, you know, when Bismarck started social security in Germany in 1870, 1880, uh, it was easy to give people social security at age 60 because men especially basically died at age 60. Right. So, so, but now we're, we're, we're living longer and longer and we've reduced infant mortality. And so the population has grown. So there are, there are, so there are more humans, uh, we're living longer and we've also been getting taller, as I mentioned, uh, if, if for a long time we thought of, let's say, Japanese as short, but if you look at Shohei Otani, the great baseball player, you know, he's six, three, three inches tall. And in 1950, he would have been an incredible freak in Japan. But now if you go to Japan or, or uh, Korea or China, you know, there are lots of tall people now. And uh, so, so again, as a result of better diet and maybe even electricity it's possible that the presence of electric fields help bones grow uh uh so the it's so we we've gotten uh, we've gotten the we've gotten we've in our terms of our lifetimes we've we've uh, things have changed too well, it's interesting because as you're saying that I'm pulling up one of your slides here on global life expectancy and I've shown this slide in lectures that I've done on the electrification and that how this huge jump in life expectancy was very was closely correlated with the electrification around the world. Um, but that is interesting that, you know, everybody used to think of the Dutch. Well, the Dutch were the tallest, you know, they just kind of naturally, they were tall Dutchmen. And then, um, and, and you mentioned Otani. So what else about this lifetime and, and mortality we've seen, or I read something or maybe I'm, I'm looking back at your slides here, but that actually life expectancy in the U S has fallen somewhat and other countries, even developed countries, Russia, they've had seen in increases in, in, uh, or decreases in life expectancy. Yeah. What, how do you explain uh, that? What, what well, is, let me, is, let is me this a natural, to... a natural occurrence or is it bad diet? Are we eating too much, uh, too many cupcakes? What, what do you, how do you attribute this? Yeah, no, I want to speak about these offsetting things, but let me first just finish on the other big phenomenon in the lifetime performance is what we call rectangularization. So it used to be, let's say, people were born up here with high performance, and then already by the time they were 20 or 30 or 40, uh, they were they were declining in their performance. But, you know, 30 became the new 40, and 40 became the new 50, and 50 became the new 60, and 
70 is now, you know, the, 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 the or, uh, or excuse me, the other, you know, 80 is now the, the, the new 70. You have all kinds of people. My back, my back, by the way, feels every morning like I'm 85, even though I'm 62. <laughs> but my maybe my back is prematurely aging. But never, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But no, but if you think again of the, I'll say just the, the the lifestyle of your parents or grandparents, especially when they were 60 or 70 years old, they didn't ride bicycles, run marathons, uh, do triathlons, uh, you know, hike in the mountains. Uh, so, in, in many ways. Uh, you know, people are now the this. So people are the 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 healthy lifespan and the active lifespan for most people in most countries now is much much longer. So instead of this sort of you know decay starting in early, people are are having 60, 70, 75, 78, 80 years of life where they're performing at a high level. So this rectangularization is a really big phenomenon. But then we're starting to see on the lifetime side some offsetting things. This is the the very sad and scary part of what's going on in countries, uh, including the U.S., very importantly, uh, uh, in the mid-teens, let's say 2015, 2016, we saw the first drop in life expectancy in this country in a, in a very long time, uh, heavily associated with, uh, with opioids and uh, substance abuse. And then during COVID, we've seen it again, partly coming from, from COVID, but also coming from uh, this drug epidemic. Uh, 100, 100, 107,000 people died of substance abuse in the U.S. in 2021, uh, many of those from fentanyl and I would say meth-related. And those that takes people who are 20 or 30, 40 years old. So it takes a lot of life years away. Most of the COVID people dying are over 70, even over 75. So they may be losing two or three or five years, but the younger people uh, are losing a lot. So so we see this reversal in uh, uh, and that's happening in Russia and a number of other countries. So we've seen uh, uh, associated with lifestyles. We've also seen that in vision. Uh, uh, People's eyesight, especially in Asia, has really been deteriorating the last 30, 40 years. And more and more people are myopic. And it seems to have to do with lifestyles. Again, if children are outside and look to the horizon and see, look for things far away, your eyes and your eye muscles get stronger and better. Uh, and if you, if you spend your time staring at a cell phone or a tablet computer and in a classroom, uh, then your eyes, when you're young, apparently they don't seem to uh, to develop as much. And so there are incredible epidemics of myopia in Korea, Japan, China, Singapore, Hong Kong. Uh, and it's also uh, starting to happen in the in uh, the uh, the uh, the other OECD type countries. So so after again, if you add, if you compare 1750 or 1800 to 1950, even let's say 1970, you know, people were taller, they had better eyesight on average, whatever, they they lived longer. But we're starting to see as a result of a uh, variety of factors uh, uh, that maybe uh, we're, hit, we're, we're hitting peaks. There's a big debate about actual lifespan. Uh, and again, we are still on average in many societies living longer, but let's say where it's harder and harder to win one more month of of uh, of life when you're 90 than it was when you're 70. Well, let's follow up on that myopia thing because that's a totally new idea to me, and is and 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 I'm going to challenge you a little bit. So, is it a hypothesis that it's a lot of the screen time that's contributing to the to the vision issue, or is there some science that that backs this up about? Uh, I'm one of the few people in my family that doesn't wear glasses. I, I, although I did buy some readers that I'm you know, having to use some, but uh, how, 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 how do we know that this myopia, the, the causes of this, in, uh, you, uh, an epidemic of myopia? How do we know this? Well, the, I would say the actual decline in vision is very well documented and mm. the Asian countries especially have led this. And there are several studies. Now the, the cause and effect, the hypothesis, the, there the hypotheses are about the things I've mentioned about lifestyles, yeah. about right. I'll say too much time reading or staring at things, and not uh, it's part of a broader uh, phenomenon that some people call nature deficit disorder. You know that if you if you aren't outside enough, I'll come back to this. If if you if you if you 
in some ways, the life that, let's say, a Neanderthal had or a person had in a more agricultural society was healthy, and that being outside, especially early in life, you 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 know you you learn a lot. You educate your senses in a lot of ways, as well as your muscles. And so it may be that the again the sum of lifestyle changes, but particularly with people now uh, spending so many hours staring at at uh, uh, cell phones, uh, tablets, uh, computers, and again living in small spaces, uh, you know, at all all day long, you know, not so. I mean, people always were were. People always spent a lot of time indoors, but when they were weren't indoors for the hour or two they were outside, they were you know if you were on the African savanna, you needed to see things far away. That's uh, really that's really interesting. I, 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 I that's a new term for me, nature deficit disorder. But it, I guess what my response is that oh, because people aren't outside being challenged or being stimulated, that those senses then atrophy or something that that that, that muscle not is not being exercised makes it flaccid then i guess i'm just in, in in just riffing here but that sounds like i'm reflecting back what i'm hearing and that brings us to the a third of the dimensions that i mentioned uh the immune system performance because similar things have happened with asthma and allergies uh where uh it asthma and allergies used to be relatively rare and now in many societies and, and especially in urban areas uh asthma and allergies and other immune and autoimmune diseases have become much more common. And there are a couple of hypotheses about this, again, which relate to two lifestyles. One of them is called the hygiene hypothesis, that it was act it's actually healthy to be exposed to mud and dogs and cats, that again, your immune system, particularly, let's say the first uh, five, six, eight years of your life, develops because you're exposed to uh, to microbes uh, uh, of various kinds uh, and you educate your immune system and you become stronger. Uh, another variant on that has to do with over possible overuse of detergents and soap, I'll say. Uh, it may be that we're cleaning our skin so much that it's easier for things uh, harmful things to get in. Mm. <laughs> so we, we, you know, we used to sort of be covered in a film a lot of the time if you took a bath once a week. So, so uh, there are several hypotheses that relate to, to modern lifestyles that suggest uh, the immune system education that a child got on a, let's say a, a farm in, in uh, Oklahoma uh, in 1900 or 1950, uh, or I'd say, including uh, uh uh, Native Americans, whatever, would have actually been a better immune system education than we're getting. You know, we, we've gotten so interested in in you know, sterile, hygienic environments. Well, so I read that back is that it's good for kids to eat dirt or to be out in the mud and you know eat bugs or you know whatever it is. Oh, don't eat that. Well, go ahead, have a have a mouthful. It doesn't taste very good, and you're going to learn. <laughs> you know, but the too much coddling of the of the of the of the system, right, of the body is bad is that would that be a fair a fair yeah. read back the french have this wonderful phrase the nostalgia for the mud the nostalgie de la boue uh, <laughs> so which is you know when you moved from the countryside to paris you know but somebody you would still have this nostalgia for the mud now of course some people might have died as a result of uh, of an allergy or something like that so it's not to say that this, this was good for everybody but we may be uh, we may be neglecting our own uh, uh, immune system education. Now we can artificially substitute with COVID. Vaccinations are a form of immune system education, and so obviously uh, th those those work, and that's great. And so, as I say, there are good things like polio, uh, or you know, the, the whole set of vaccinations that have been enormously helpful in having in our human performance enhancement. But it may be that our lifestyles, you know, as with the the vision, let's say, that the immune system education, this living in these more sterile environments, uh, or what people wish were sterile environments, uh, and not having exposure to dogs and cats and mud, uh, you know, we need to make up, compensate for that with lots of lots of vaccinations, so to say. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Well, and there you have a really interesting slide in your slides, which I assume will be on the 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 uh, uh, program for the Human Environment website sometime soon. 
Yes, we'll the the Nirenberg lecture will be posted on the on the University of California San Diego uh, with I think within a week or two, and we'll be publishing a uh, a, a a more polished version uh, uh, ourselves here. And that, by the way, so again, my guest is Jesse Osterbell. He's the director of the program for the human environment at Rockefeller University. Uh, you can find a lot about him at phe.rockefeller.edu. Um, it's your 26th slide here. I just want to finish on this immune system idea, but there's a really interesting paper. Um, I think it was in the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology comparing the Amish and the Hutterites. Uh, can you talk about that? Because that seems in yeah. direct line with what you're just discussing about this exposure to uh, to uh, dirty stuff or poop or, you know, whatever. But yeah. talk about that, because that to me seems a very interesting uh, comparison of two fairly similar groups. So very good researchers at the University of Chicago and elsewhere have been studying uh, the Amish and the Hutterites, both of who, who come from similar genetic backgrounds. I'll say similar migrant G German backgrounds. Uh and also live collectively in rather similar ways and are engaged in agriculture. But the Amish continue to use animals for a lot of their work, horses, so forth. And the Amish children have a lot of contact, direct contact with cows, with horses, uh, also with cats and dogs. Whereas the Hutterites are much more motorized. Uh, and also uh, in terms of their own homes, what goes on within the homes? Uh, there are many fewer pets. Uh, 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 so, so the and the Amish children have notably low levels of asthma and allergy, whereas the Hutterites have levels that are much higher and more like the rest of us. So, this is a kind of pretty controlled experiment in lifestyles. Uh, so, yeah. So, if you have children or grandchildren, and they they you know, it's good to go to the beach and play in the sand. It's good to play in the yard and roll around in the grass. Uh, and uh, there was a Finnish study which found that uh, two dogs and a cat, I think, were I, I'm I'm simplifying a bit, but that uh, two dogs and a cat were good for good for for children. Well, so then if I'm reading this back to you, then it, there's some inoculation, I think would be even the right word about yes. have, being around things that are messy and dirty and th that are in nature inoculates us against nature. Is that a, another way to think yeah. about it? Well, again, the immune system is a learning system. The immune system is not that different from the brain in that sense. Uh, you know, and, and the same way you, you uh, will come to this now, I hope about you can learn to read, uh, uh, you, you, your immune system learns to recognize foreign uh, objects, so to say, and threats, and it learns to uh, to handle them. And so if you deprive it of that experience, let's say until you're 50 or 60 or 70, and then you're hit by COVID or whatever, uh, you know, you may be more vulnerable than, uh, you know, to early in early childhood and youth. I mean, it's, it's as with your bones or whatever, you know, if you have a wound when you're very young, uh, things heal very fast. Your system right. is, it knows how to respond very well. So, so yeah. So, so I think this, this concept of immune system education is one that we need to include uh, in our lives. Well, let me follow up on that for just a second, because it's, to me, it's fascinating. And I, I you know, watching what's happening in China with these COVID lockdowns and the fact that China created these vaccines that didn't work. And that now as a, as a population group, no, they've had very little exposure to the to the the virus and so they're all more vulnerable the whole system the whole society is more vulnerable because they haven't been gradually inoculating themselves as we've done here in the US is that a fair read of what we've seen in China yes well robert as you know in our area of energy and electricity uh, decades ago people made a fuss about what they called brittle power and uh uh systems and and I think one of the concerns one of the risks with these with our highly urbanized societies in which you know uh people are born in very controlled environments in hospitals uh you know with very little exposure and then again live in apartments with you know with HEPA filters and whatever uh and go to schools again with the uh, HVAC systems that highly controlled. Again, you could imagine we're creating a population that later in life will be brittle, that, you know, that it, uh, now, again, 
science, as with the mRNA vaccines, science may come along and quickly, you know, in six months or a year or two years, have a new solution uh, or a treatment at least. But uh, but it's possible that we're that uh, again we need to th- rethink this whole sort of lifetime of immune education, and uh, it, it may be that again what some of what people used to do. Uh, including playing outside at recess uh, in the dirt is good for your eyes and and uh, your resistance to uh, to flus and other problems. The, the, what comes to mind and it is this, uh, well, I'll paraphrase the coddling of the human mind. We, we can't coddle the body too much then it would be another way to think about this, I suppose. Yeah. And we understand, I mean, we're perfectly willing to do that with jumping jacks or, or, you know, or we, we understand that exercise is good for your muscles, but exercise in some sense may also be good for your immune system. So then the last area is the, the cognitive, the IQ and, and our education systems and uh, uh, the changes in how we learn and, and, you know, the, how the, I've thought about it for my own kids about, well, I like books. I like the physical thing and the thingness of the thing matters to me. But tell, talk to me about then the, this other area about are we are we reaching the limit of how smart we can be? And how is this affected by all the screen time in the World Wide Web? How do you how do you how do you boil this down? That may be the case. And there do seem to be analogies with, you know, the physical performance, the Olympic sorts of things. Uh, again, if you go back to to 1800, 1900, 1950, uh, in you know, first people didn't know how to read, and then literacy spread through through most societies, and now just about everywhere in the world, there's 90 percent, 95 percent literacy of adults. Uh, similarly, education. You know, first there were kindergartens and primary schools, and then middle schools were added, and then high schools and requirements for or urging people to get high school diplomas, and then and then uh, uh, post-secondary education colleges, and now you know about half of all people start uh, start university in America and in Europe. Not everybody finishes, but you know a lot of people are in school until they're let's say 20, 21, 22 years old, and presumably they've been learning. Uh, and then there's just the IQ aspect, which may have to do with uh, with diet and ex- and exposure, not just formal education not just book learning, but uh, exposure to the world. And even, again, for the people who didn't have good eyesight, uh, the fact, you know, if they get glasses so they can read and see things better. Uh, and there are really quite phenomenal records showing that from 1900 up pretty much to 2000, uh, IQ was rising everywhere, all, all the continents. Uh, so to the extent you believe educational testing or intelligence testing, uh, People were getting smarter every decade by the kind of, at least by the testing that was going on. So if you look at this collection of things, again, of of, uh, literacy, uh, uh, time and uh, educational attainment, uh, IQ, it looks like, I'll say, in most societies, again, you could think your children were going to know more than you did when you were their age, whatever, uh, and probably be, it appears some sense brighter. But the same problem, this sort of plateauing seems to have occurred. Uh, so and, fit, yeah. and fits and fits on an S curve as well. So yes, talk about fit that. very and nicely. Talk, so it, well, so if, can you tie these? <clears throat> we've talked about physical lifetime, cognitive, immune, and you've plotted in, in your in your slides all of them pretty well on an S curve. Explain that. Is that is that just a natural? You've talked about S curves before in your work, but it, it, this this bit of uh, research and 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 uh, an inquiry, it, you bring it really to the fore. Is or S curve yeah. something we should expect in all kinds of things like this? What talk about the S curve? Well, you know, uh, there is some. You know, a lot of things do grow to limits. Uh, you know, if you think of something like a sunflower, uh, you know, you can you can fertilize it, you can give it light, and so forth, and you can you know you can grow much bigger sunflowers now than than people may have done a hundred years ago optimizing again the uh, uh, water light fertilizer nutrients uh maybe playing at the right music uh <laughs> but uh uh you know finally there is some i'll say some potential beyond which it gets very hard to 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 grow now because it reaches a, because it example, reaches a structure might, of- 
you there's a structural to... limit then that it reaches. If uh, just a fi- this, it's a finite, it can't grow any taller without toppling over. Or is it, yeah, it... there are real problems. Again, you could do other, you know, you can put a stake next to it, or again, you might be able to now do genetic engineering, but you've exhausted a lot of the potential, you know, the sort of e- easy innate potential. And so it, so that idea of growing to limits, the sort of in the kind of usually symmetrical S curve, S curve way, that that uh, th- and that's how lots of things grow. I mean, it's documented for many, many biological processes, whether it's for the individual sunflower or for a collection of of microbes growing in a nutrient agar. So they they sort of exhaust the easy potential of what's there. And so in this uh, in the in this area of cognitive performance, it may be that over the last 200, 250 years with, again, with literacy and also, you know, education, schools and better instruction and more stimulating environments, which could include, you know, movies or TV or theater or travel, whatever. It may be, again, that we've exhausted, you know, we've sort of harvested the easy stuff or taken advantage of the easy stuff. Uh, So it seems in this area, too, uh, that if you look at in the U.S. especially, it's quite frightening at a number of measures of uh, standardized testing, uh, educational attainment. Uh, the We seem to be sort of stuck on a plateau uh, uh, by many measures these last uh, uh, 20, 30 years. So what occurs to me as you're saying that, Jesse, is that our brains are in some ways just similar to our legs, right? We've, we've reached about a limit of how fast we can go, 20 to 23 miles an hour, and we've reached a limit on how well our brains can perform. Is that a, is that a fair way to think about it? Well, I would say it's we don't know for sure, and it's a high potential. Again, as with the best basketball player or uh, uh, you know the best marathon runner. So you know I think many, many, most people are way below their potential. So again, I think it'll be much easier to raise the average or to raise the bottom quartile than it may be. But the the, the top performers to win further gains is going to be hard. But Peter, people are trying like crazy, and this is where we come back to the the drugs, like the you know whether it was Lance Armstrong or or Jose Canseco or or uh, Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds uh, on the on the cognitive side, people have just gone crazy. Uh, Taking Abilify and and Adderall and Ritalin, uh, and the 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 consumption of uh, of uh, what are called psychotropic drugs uh, to help people concentrate to deal with what people call attention deficit disorders, it's it's just astronomical. Not only in the U.S., all, all, it's spread all over. So so people are really worried that you know they're not learning fast enough. They can't concentrate, and of course they're a tradi- you know caffeine. Uh, and other traditional uh, 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 drugs uh, are in this niche too. So there's this huge pharmaceutical industry, both licit and Ill- illicit, or uh, on label and off label, right. uh, uh, where people are trying still to enhance their cognitive performance uh, through uh, through the these further techniques. It's a bit like the vaccines. I mean, if you can't do it naturally, then you know maybe you can take a, a pill or have some kind of, uh, uh, you know, so, some kind of aid to, to uh, you know, now people want to do deep brain stimulation, put electrodes in your brain. And I tried one of these with a helmet. Uh, I don't think it had any effect, but, uh, you know, I did it as part of my research, I'll say. Uh, so there uh, may but, be, you know, there, there may are... be the equivalent of the new track shoe for the brain. Then there may be some equivalent of this that we could use to get further gains out of our own intellect then that we haven't quite found yet. Yes, there is, there, are, there is this transcranial stimulation. There are these, I say there are ideas and, you know, science certainly will uncover new ways to do this, but sort of the general point now, I think you're getting the overall picture is that we've had this incredible 200 year run in America, in England, in in France, Germany, Switzerland, but catching up in the last hundred years in in Brazil or in 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 uh, Thailand, where uh, people run faster, jump higher, got taller, uh, live longer, got smarter, got higher IQs. But winning the gains these last 20, 30 years now seems harder, and the offsetting problems. Are growing. So, for example, obesity 
So on the one hand, it was great to have more calories and protein for a long time, and we grew taller and ran faster. But now we have the problem, uh, you know, this is a big pro part of the problem with COVID, you know, the co comorbidity with hyperlipidemia and obesity. So, you know, people are now, uh, we're, you know, a lot of people, you know, like a billion people are now uh, uh, overweight, uh, uh, you know, which is bad for your heart, bad for your longevity, uh, ba bad for your immune system dealing with things like COVID. So... So I'm glad, you, so I'm glad you talked about the obesity because that was one of the slides that I'd pulled up that I, because then that also contributes, as I understand it, obesity, diabetes, these other morbidities that are, are, you know, really problematic and are lifetime types of, of, uh, of, I, I hesitate to use the word disability, but I think that's the right word, isn't it? I mean, that, that yeah. this, these things tend to mean shorter lifespans and, 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 and lower quality of life over very long periods of time that, not only affect the individual, they affect the individuals about, around them and therefore the entire society. So it is a worrisome trend. It, it, and But take us back to diet. You, it, it, is it too much calories? Is it, is it high fructose corn syrup? What do you, what, how do you, what do you think well, might be the, the reason for all this? I think it's mainly too much. This is, a, in a way, a, a somewhat different conversation. But let the uh, I'll say broadly speaking, uh, under capitalism, we don't really optimize. You know, the, the shoe industry wants to sell you more shoes or sneakers than you really need. Uh, you know, the the, uh, the music industry, you know, Spotify wants more of your attention than, uh, and, you know, the food industry, uh, you know, wants, you know, they're not interested in giving you the optimal amount of food. They're happy to sell more product. This has been a lot of the criticism of the energy industry too, as you know, that uh, you know people are wasteful with light or heat, uh, and the electric power companies haven't tried to you know be sell you the efficient amount of of uh, energy for your home. But you know if you want to put in you know you know whatever Klieg lights for your yard. Uh, so I think broadly speaking, we have a you know an economic system where you know people have. I'll say more shoes and and uh, more calories uh, uh, and more things than they need. So it's it's uh, so it's uh, it's ha very hard to uh, now you could you could offset try to offset it with more exercise and so forth. But but the but we tend to yeah we tend to encourage a lot of consumption and a lot of consumption of calories uh, leads to to obesity, which is a, a, a real threat. And it's one, as I've said, you know, there's the declining eyesight, there's the asthma. So it, overall, you know, after this 200 year run, you know, we're sort of getting fatter and fainter eyesight and maybe less resistant to some diseases. And even people worry, there are some studies, it's hard to know how, how strong these really are, showing that sperm counts are down, that testosterone is down, and this again, these again may have to do with uh, lifestyle issues, diet, chemicals in the environment. So, so again, the kind of overall picture is, in terms of peak human is we had this great S curve, and now it's harder to win gains. And the, as we win the further gains, there seem to be more there more more fallout or problems associated. Uh, you know, you can again think of something like steroids. You know, obviously, you steroids can help your performance, but they also can, you know, they they affect your health in other ways. Sure. So, so as we're winning these further gains, we're we're they're offsetting things. So it's it seems that after, so we maybe, uh, maybe peak human uh, is you know maybe it's not so far away. So if I'm going to paraphrase one of my own book titles, it's uh, fatter, slower, dumber. <laughs> <laughs> fatter slower dumber blinder i don't know <laughs> yes yeah well that's um, the worry no that's exactly right that's that's the uh, worry the good thing is this rectangularization so you know for a big chunk of your life you're going to have instead of just being sort of healthy and vigorous for 30 or 40 years you may have a very uh, you know a, a long run but it's but it's i'd say going from peak human and then the total of us, I mean, this relates also to the things like the testosterone and the sperm counts, the drive, uh, you know, there, of course, this could be good for the trees and the fish, but uh, 
the uh, you know there's a kind of uh, the the uh, you know we may also be near most of all the I'd say all all the major population projections now predict a plateau in the 20th in the 21st century some as low as let's say 9.5 billion some 10 or 11 uh, so we may be within let's say 10 percent of peak humans and we may be pretty clear pretty close to at the individual level the peak human also uh, america is a little bit of an exception in terms of population because we're still growing mostly because of immigration right uh, but uh but you know, if you look at China, China is well. Peak baby occurred in the year 2012. That was the year in which the globally the most babies were born, about 140 or 144 million. And now there are fewer babies being born each year. And so we met. To, I, I, th I think 2012 may have been. Who knows? Maybe that was the year of peak human and peak humans. And uh, you know, now we're heading down, you know, the, in, in, and this will have big uh, effects. I mean, if you think of geopolitics, China has 1.4 billion, but by 2100, uh, uh, China may be only six or 700 million people. Right. Uh, and the U.S., which is now 330 or 340, could be 400 or 500. I mean, the U.S. and China in 2100 may not be, the, you know, now there are four Chinese for every American. It may be that there are, you know, let's say one point two or 1.3 Chinese for every American by 2100, if things continue this way. So there are big changes. Sure. Afoot. Yeah, the birth rate issue is one that is, I, I'm not a demographer, but I, I'm fascinated by that whole study. And Peter Zion is one of, you know, demographer and using this in a lot of his his work lately. I mentioned him before. Well, so let's talk about sports. I know you're a long time. If I may just say one yeah. more thing on this. The yeah, last of aspect of this is, but machines are still getting smarter. And the... Uh, uh, the, you know, they, 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 they play chess, uh, you know, whatever, almost any aspect of, uh, of machines that you think about, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's this new Minecraft AI program that, uh, uh, was created by open AI that watched 70,000 hours of Minecraft playing and now plays at top level, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the and 5,000 papers are being published every month now about artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's an incredible, that's a real S-curve. Uh, so, so in the same way that horsepower zoomed, let's say, between 1800 and 2000, the, the cognitive side of machines is now taking off just like the horsepower did, you know, with the Newcomen engine. And so during the century, even if humans stay sort of our performance sort of stays around where it is the machines are cognitively are going to zoom by us so so we really have a lot to think about in the same way that we got we adjusted to to the the motor and the engine uh in the 19th century you know i think as many people are saying in 21st century you know the cognitive we have to we're going to have to learn to live with these uh uh with the uh these machines that just surpass us at pretty much everything. Yeah. And who knows what, I mean, how would you have predicted or how Henry Ford have predicted in 1908 that what the, what the model T would have, you know, how it would have changed society Would maybe we're at a similar situation there with her AI in terms of what that, how that's going to affect how we live in the years ahead. Um, so okay, let's talk sports. about sports. Yeah. We've been, we've been talking for almost an hour, Jesse. Um, I know you're a longtime Yankees fan, but you quit going to games, as I recall. And uh, you, it, it, we have a mutual friend, John Hoberman. You, you put on a seminar a few years ago, and John was there. He's from UT Austin. I interviewed him a long time ago for the Austin Chronicle about his book, Darwin's Athletes. I'm just re recalling that, uh, talking with John about that. And I asked him if he watched sports anymore, and he said, no. He said, I know too much. Yeah. Um, that he, you know, he'd written about doping and, you know, and about the, you know, what the corruption of sports. And I still, I, I see the corruption, but I also see the purity of it, right? Like Morocco beating Spain in the World Cup or something, you know, these improbable things. And it's just some, it's such an amazing reflection of the human spirit. Are you still a sports fan? Do you still follow the Yankees? Where, where, do, where do you, how does all this peak human fit into your appreciation of sports? Well, uh, during COVID, one of the effects of the three years of COVID was to greatly diminish my interest, especially in professional sports. And uh, but I, I think this had been sort of 
simmering in, in a certain way for a while, and it relates to some of the, th the things we've been discussing. Uh, uh, the good side of sports is that they're they're a fantasy life. You know, they're an alter alternate reality. It's it's a, it's a never ending soap opera, uh, and you know, for most people, I mean, sports turned out, you know, if, to be the true opiate of the masses. Uh, fentanyl is doing pretty well too, but I think if I, you know. You, you, in all of Karl Marx, you won't find anything about soccer or uh, American football or the NBA. Uh, but in many ways, it's turned out that, uh, well, the Romans understood this. Anyway, it, 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 in many ways, it's turned out that, uh, you know, four billion people, half of the global population is watching the Soccer World Cup. And people love it. And it's this, it's a wonderful, again, it's a soap opera in which finally, Aside from sometimes a broken heart about your team losing, uh, you know the consequences uh, are you know the, you, you don't suffer much. Right. I mean, so so it's in many ways it's a wonderful form of 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 entertainment, um, and it's again it's had this incredible development since the British and a few others sort of uh, formalized it in you know eighteen fifty or so, and the America too with basketball and so forth, baseball, uh, but. I feel it's really suffered. It's partly what I was saying about selling too many shoes. The money, everything has gotten too long. So games that were interesting for two hours or two hours and 15 minutes are now three and a half and four hours long. Right. And the reason is simply money and advertising. And it yep. doesn't matter whether it's tennis or baseball or football or basketball. You know, in the last two minutes of a basketball, an NBA game can last half an hour. Right. And it's all about selling and commercialism so partly i think it's just to me partly i think it's gotten dull another thing that really troubles me is the gambling uh, gambling and gaming are also going through an enormous s-curve logistic growth now not only in the u.s and i think this is really problematic because the soap opera part the fantasy part of uh, sports is that you root for players and teams but gambling breaks your allegiances. Mm. You root for you root to win your bet. You know, if right. you bet that the next batter will strike out, or if you bet that your you know uh, your team will lose, uh, uh, you know this it's a famous problem. But you start to you bet it. You so instead of wanting the Houston Astros or the New York Yankees to win, you start only caring about the outcome of your bets. And now people can bet on every. You know, on every point, every toss, every shot, right. and so I think uh, I think the 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 uh, I think the combination of extending things too long for all the advertising and then the gambling. I think I think it's really changed. Uh, I, I think we sort of had a really good thing where sports, sort of in the early days of professional sports, it was still had a lot of the charm of amateur sports and. Some college football still has that, the incredible enthusiasm. And that enthusiasm comes from this, again, I'll say this fantasy life. Right. It doesn't come from the, finally, the betting, I don't think, provides that. So the betting then um, disturbs that allegiance or interrupts yeah. the allegiance that had been there for years. And now it's more about the allegiance to the latest bet. I, but I, I agree with you in, in some of my... Uh, you know, taking my television out of the house was just a liberating thing, right? I have much more time for, well, I work more part of that, but you know, my wife, Lauren plays the piano more. I don't play piano, guitar, but I don't, I, you know, I've picked it up more. I, you know, it's this, I've seen enough beer and pickup commercial ads, right? I've seen enough advertisements and I just finally got so frustrated with it. Um, but the, the the popularity of sports, as you, as you point out, it seems like it is completely undiminished, and the and this and the commercialization has only grown, especially with this NIL uh, situation in college sports, where now Deion Sanders is going to Colorado, and he's essentially created a freelance college football team in which anyone can any athlete who qualifies can say, well, I'm going to Colorado to play for Dion because it just has changed this whole system that's been very secure for a long time and now it's completely changed because of the money and i i, I tend to agree with you in terms of what that means and it it, it doesn't have the stickiness to me as it used to exactly. i guess would be I, think the way I think about it it's the breaking of affiliations and allegiances so i, I think it may turn out to be a short-term optimization uh that they'll in the short run the owners and the businesses will make a lot of money but i think in the long run 
you know, your affiliation with Ozzie Smith or the St. Louis Cardinals or, or, you know, uh, it could be a coach, it can be a player, uh, a team, you know, I, I think it's, that's that, you know, if all you want to do is just, you know, so to say, watch, I mean, it becomes more like horse racing. All you're doing is watching the bets. Mm. Uh, and I, I think that's, I think that's to me, uh, it's much, you know, I, because it's to me, it's less interesting. And so that that combination of things. Uh, also, I'd say the third element I'd mention, and your friend and guest Roger Pilkey is one of the world's leading experts and fascinating and smart about this. The other thing is, I think some of the same kinds of analyses that I've been talking with you about human performance, I think are having not necessarily having a good feedback the you know money ball and baseball too much reliance on on data uh the uh part of what happened in baseball uh i think was in the end it's too much data you know so it led to have it leads to teams using five six seven pitchers each which right. again makes the game longer and then you know poor jesse i you know i have some time to follow baseball and you know when i wanted to you know i could follow catfish hunter or i could uh uh, you know, follow some particular player. But Cat, when, Catfish when Hunter and Ozzie Smith. In, you, in you, pulled, same... you pulled Ozzie Smith and Catfish Hunter out of the bag there. They <laughs> haven't played baseball in 40, 30 or 40 years. That's Okay, well, so let me ask. So you don't even read the box scores or you don't follow I've, the Yankees I've at stopped. all? You I'm gave up your tickets. I, I have watched some of the World Cup. Uh, soccer has the advantage that the games are still yeah. relatively yeah. short. The added time is the stop stoppage time has grown that used to be two minutes and now they're all nine but but i would say soccer has the advantage that basically it's you know the game is 105 minutes yeah yeah i agree i i i, I love it that there are no commercials so uh, the last few questions here jesse because we've been talking for now more than an hour and uh, my guest again is jesse osabel he's the director of the program for the human environment at rockefeller university you can find him at phe.rockefeller.edu you're we've talked about peak human peak humans what are the biggest challenges then facing us and my us i'm using the uh, royal papal we here what is the biggest challenges you think facing us as humanity now given all these things you've outlined well i i think it's the the, the single word is motivation mm. uh, i think that's the the, the you know the you know, it, it's like this, you know, the, the animated film Wally, you know, do do we just want to become couch potatoes uh, and just consume sports, consume uh, potato chips, uh, have everything delivered to us, you know, now to our door, uh, you know, just or order things on your phone? Uh, I, I think the real question is, uh, you know, do we sort of want to break a sweat mentally or physically? Uh, mm -hmm. It's getting easier and easier not to do so, uh, and I, I think in the, the uh, so in in a sense I think that's one of the master questions. Uh, you know, I think we again, if you think of your parents or grandparents or great grandparents, the incentives to work and to do things were very strong because people wanted to live longer to you know to do all these things, and now. In a sense, uh, you're, 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 people are sort of in the rich societies anyway, are sort of guaranteed a lot. And so I think, you know, the, the big question for me is whether there, there, there really will be much uh, motivation. A second question, and it's, it is actually a question, which I, I love to ask at dinner parties or whatever, is who is the real me? Right. Because if you're, you know, if, if you're, uh, and it, I mean, it can be, obviously it's, uh, it can be eyeglasses and hearing aids, or I have dental implants, which I'm enormously grateful for. So, you know, I can still eat apples and, uh, chew on uh, carrots and whatever. But the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, if you think until recently, the real me was, you sort of knew who the real person was, but, but as we are using more and more pharmaceuticals, relying more and more on various kinds of prostheses, whether it's sneakers or, or you know, artificial knees or all of these things. You know, the, I think as we go fur further and further into the century, I think this question uh, is of who is the real me is really important. That also relates to cosmetic surgery because a lot of people want youth and beauty. They don't just want, you know, to be able to read. 
so so you know people there are all of these ways that people can change themselves uh and then but then you know i think at a deep level you have to ask who is the real me and that's the closing slide in your presentation ecce homo right which i guess is the my latin i, I assume that's latin i don't you know, i didn't have a latin in in uh, yes. high school but uh well, so then the last question is then, Jesse, and you know, I've asked these before. So what are you reading? Um, I know you have a pile of papers and books and you all your office is very busy with uh, all kinds of reading material. What's on the top of your your stack these days? Well, I have a, I have a lot here. I, I'm, I'm a big book person, as you know. And so on a professional level, I'm, I'm reading books like Exploring Animal Behavior Through Sound, a fantastic new book from Christine Erba in, in Australia, uh, you know, Sound is really important uh, for animal behavior, especially in the oceans. But you're a birder, uh, so that's something uh, really interesting. I, and I'm starting to get uh, Christmas present books. I just got uh, uh, this book: How Plants Solve Crimes, uh, uh, Planting Clues by a botany professor. Uh, and uh, the criminal always leaves traces of their presence, as the great forensic scientist. Uh, said in this book gibson highlights the importance of plants when it comes to solving crimes so that would be part of my christmas reading uh i also and you don't you don't uh, do you read on a kindle at all or you 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 very it's little. All, all paper. I, I, well, I read all day at uh 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 you know at my computer so a lot of scientific stuff and you know the mag the journals i read and then i was also just given last evening a new book called wings of war by david and margaret white a new book that's just published this week about the P-51 Mustang, uh, the the aircraft that was really incredibly important for the uh, the uh, Allied victory in World War II. Sure. And then I, 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 on the more novel side, uh, I, I think there's something I've mentioned to you. I've been reading the murder, the the mysteries of uh, the first set of American murder mysteries written in the 1920s by a man named S.S. Van Dyne, the Philo Vance murder mysteries. Huh. Right. So one is called like the Canary Murder Case. And these were written from the mid-20s to the mid-30s. And they're absolutely charming. They're set in New York City. Uh, they're not very violent or scary by modern standards, uh, but they're clever and fun. And Philo Vance was a name I heard as a kid. People would say, because I was you know, sort of interested in science and detectiving kinds of things. And you know, so Philo Vance was the first American detective. Uh, the, well, that wings yeah. of war sounds interesting because you know i love airplanes i love you know engines and such but it was the marrying of that that plane design with the more powerful engine it was the rolls royce v12 if i remember it was uh the increase in horsepower was the absolute essential part of it and then high octane gasoline was the other part there that uh, memory serves was the absolute well, a, a critical ingredient i haven't read the book yet but it's uh it, so i don't know the answer but you, i think you're right and uh, okay. it looks like a, it, it, i did look a little bit at a few pages last evening it's ve it's very well written uh, david and margaret white uh wings of war the last thing i'll book i'll mention my sure. godfather uh my name is jesse my godfather jesse clarkson was a historian of russia and huh. in the 1960s he wrote an 800 page history of russia uh which i'd had on my shelf for 60 years and never read uh, <laughs> and i finally read it it's fantastic and it's a thousand year history of russia and nothing changes uh I've been reading about <laughs> it's, re it's re and a lot of it is there's a lot about ukraine and uh and crimea and anyway absolutely fascinating and uh Really, really. So if you want to read a history of Russia, there I'm sure there are good new ones, but the Jesse Clarkson classic from the 60s published by Random House. You know, it was a it was a you know, it was a big, you know, it wasn't a it's not for, you know, it's it's well written and interesting. It's not not just obscure. Sure. So last question, Jesse, you know, you're expecting this one too. So what gives you hope? Uh, you've been observing, you've been in science for your entire career and you have seen the different technologies come and go different things come and go what gives you hope as you look at where we are now and where we're going well certainly a lot of it is is uh, science uh, and technology on the science side some australian colleagues for example just obtained 1 million year old dna from some marine sediments uh, south of australia toward near antarctica uh, so just imagine a, a dna molecule surviving a million years and 
marine sediments. And of course, you can use that to identify the species it came from. So science keeps, I mean, it's doing amazing things. Uh, technology also, uh, Robert, this is something more closer to our normal subjects. Germany built a new LNG uh, storage and uh, gasification plant in 194 days. Wow. Uh, and, you know, we worry about taking 10 years to do these things. So it shows, you know, if people really, societies really mobilize, uh, you know, in basically in a little over six months, the Germans built an entire plant. Uh, uh, so, I mean, we can, it, when, again, it's the motivation question. Uh, so great things can happen. Uh, uh, I always love the Internet Archive, Brewster Kahle's, uh it's amazing to me that we're still managing to capture and archive uh, the internet, the Wayback Machine there. Uh, and they, they, they're, they've just uh, also uh, put online a uh, an archive of 8,000 cookbooks, including, wow. you know, so if you want to cook a Christmas meal from, you know, 1890 in Tulsa, uh, you could probably find it. Uh, so on the technology side, on the environmental side, um, the bear hunt is resuming in New Jersey. I say that because today is the first day of the conference of the parties on the biodiversity treaty in Montreal. And, you know, in North America, we've actually had some real successes at restoring biodiversity. There are about 4,000 bears in the state of New Jersey. Uh, there was a bear hunt for a few years and then people felt it wasn't, it, it wasn't the right, wasn't humane, but the, the bears, there are so many bears in New Jersey now that that the, the bear population has to be has to be managed. Mm. So, uh, you know, that we can, I think the great restoration of nature on land and in the sea, there are successes, there can be more. Uh, I'll, I'll end with two more things that, sure. that give me hope. Um, one is that uh, I just read an amazing new article in PLOS one uh, uh, by a guy named, uh, Gershman uh, about witchcraft, um, witchcraft, witchcraft beliefs around the world and exploratory analysis. Boris Gershman, G E R S H M A N, open access. If you search on witchcraft beliefs around the world, I'm sure it'll come right up. Uh, a billion people still believe in witchcraft. Uh, and I think this is good. Uh, I, I think rationality, too much rationality is, is one of the problems. Uh, I, I'm not big on, I, I think, uh, what's often called rationality or the meritocracy. I think it's they're doing a lot of harm. And we really want heterogeneity of uh, of expectations and preferences. That's really what's good for evolution. And so I, I actually think it's a kind of celebratory thing that mm. a billion people are, are sort of, uh, it's diversity. They're sort of resisting becoming, you know, like what, what economists in Chicago tell you to do. So, uh, <laughs> so I think that's good. And the last thing I'll mention uh, is that my mother is now 102 and a half and there's rectangularization and there's re real rectangularization. She still lives independently on her own and uh, drinks a mug of Italian espresso at the, uh, every morning. And uh, her favorite food is loin lamb chops. And she takes the Broadway bus to buy them. Uh, so, uh, you know, that you can su success, healthy aging, successful aging, this rectangularization, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really a great thing. I mean, again, our grandparents and great grandparents and great, great grandparents had their lives truncated for lots of reasons or their ability to, you know, they would have been rocking in the dark because they couldn't see, they couldn't hear, they could, and they wouldn't have teeth, you know, they couldn't eat. So and I, I've met your mother. Tell me your mom's name again. And a and any, um, right. I, I met her. She's uh, formidable in a small package. I met, <laughs> she doesn't cast a long, sh a big shadow, but uh, 102 and a half is, uh, is amazing. So you have a long way to go, Jesse, your career is not over yet there, mister. You got a lot of work to do. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Well, thanks Listen, for this it's opportunity. Been a, it's been it's been a joy, Jesse, to reconnect. Um, my guest again has been Jesse Osabel. Look him up at phe.rockefeller.edu. Jesse, thanks again for being on the Power Hungry Podcast. A pleasure. 
And thanks to all of you in podcast land for tuning in. Tune into the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. It might be as good as this one. Until then, see you.